Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm, my name is Evan Gilman, as, as you heard, and I'm here to talk to you about Zero Trust Networks. Um, kind of, you know, what they are, how to build them, why they're important, why we need them. Um, first, I thought I'd talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a previously network engineer from higher ed, University of Miami in academia, and uh, <clears throat> moved to Silicon Valley uh, uh, three or four years ago uh, to work at a company called PagerDuty, where I'm currently site reliability engineer. Um, working on a book on this topic, actually, Zero Trust Network, so with O'Reilly and one of my uh, uh, old coworkers. So this is kind of the first time that, that we're getting out in public and, and talking about some of these ideas and, and spreading the word, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of exciting. We're looking forward to a release uh, mid mid next year. Uh, so it's probably good to just run down what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, first to present the problem, of course. You know, like why perimeter sucks and, and all that stuff and uh, what zero trust actually is, what it means. Um, so we're talk about most of the time we'll spend uh, talking about like real world implementations of, of this stuff, um, what they look like and how, how they are manifested in real life. And then a little bit at the end uh, about State of the Union, um, where things are currently and uh, where they're heading. And also I, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, uh, one is that this was a uh, last minute talk, so I apologize in advance. And, and also um, I'd like to kind of keep it as casual as possible. So if anyone has any questions during the talk, you know, feel free to raise your hand. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll stop and answer. Yeah, Mike, thank you. Uh, feel free to get up to the mic and, and, and we can have a chat. Ah, so without further ado, the problem, of course. And uh, the problem is, is, is really just that the perimeter model is no longer effective. I, I, I think that that's really, really fair to say. Things behind perimeter firewalls get owned all the time. I mean, it's in the news almost every day. Somebody is being owned and like pervasively owned um, you know, inside their perimeter. And, and larger networks lar require larger perimeters as well. And they don't scale super well. Um, they require a lot of managing of policy, and the policy is an aggregate too, uh, which, which presents its own challenges and, and performance issues and, and things like this. Um, but perhaps even worse than that is that people feel safe uh, when they're behind a perimeter. Let's see, does this clicker work? It does, look at that. Thank you. <laughs> um, people feel safe when they're behind a perimeter, and, and I guess like, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? They're, they're in a safe area, their neighbors are friendly, but how friendly are they really, right? Um, it's not compromise. It's not hard to compromise a host be that is behind a perimeter. Uh, it can be as simple as getting a user to visit a malicious web page, right? And we have seen how how effective phishing is. So so this is pretty uh, clear and present truth. Um, with a compromised host that's living inside that trusted zone, you have to ask the question like, is it really still trusted? Um, you have actors which are malicious, which are living inside your perimeter. Um, can you really call that the trusted zone or, or have any trust on it at all? <clears throat> what additional resources would this person get by having kind of uh, this position in your network? When what safeguards might they be able to sidestep by doing this? Uh, so obviously it, it's not an ideal situation, right? Like because this big enforcement ring there is t totally neutralized. Uh, so at this point, you have to take a step back and say, well, like what, what exactly is the stuff that we're trying to protect? Uh, where is it? And considering that, where does it make sense to apply policy and policy enforcement? So I like to call this just common sense security, right? Um, if the thing that you're protecting is far away from where you're doing the enforcement, then clearly things can get between it, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that, you know, those protections should be close together. And uh, sorry, my phone's buzzing. And so the harder, the, the further away that they are from that thing that you're protecting, the harder it is to manage. Um, not only is that thing protecting multiple things, as I mentioned earlier, policy and aggregate, but it, it's also, you know, oh, we got people coming from this direction are, are stopped, but not people coming from this direction. Uh, so instead, I think it, it makes sense to apply that policy and enforcement as, as close to the thing that you're trying to protect as possible, right? Um, so this requires like a big change in thinking because it means that instead, like when you're gonna build a network, um, instead of saying, well, let me like first cordon off my space here and then build everything inside of it, you're just going to build the infra and then start with your most sensitive things and build the security there and then build it outwards successively, right? Um, so, so Zero Trust aims to solve some of, some of these perimeter shortcomings and, and challenges, uh, which leads us to the big question, like, what exactly is uh, the Zero Trust thing? So I think that um, it's most easily described as just a security model. 
it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, removes all trust from the network. So instead of trusting particular network segments, um, you'll trust devices, applications, and users. Right? So that means that the network is basically considered hostile all the time. Right? Um, and it's really, really cr critical in these kinds of networks that principle of least privilege be applied to every single flow uh, that occurs over that network. And connections will be dropped and ignored if they're not strongly authenticated and authorized beforehand. Right? So what this results in is uh, a network with, without any pools of trust. So the, the, the typical like trust and untrust interfaces that you normally see on a firewall don't, don't really have a whole lot of meaning anymore in, in this kind of a network. Um, the internal network will become just as untrusted as, as the external network is. So uh, in, a, in a world like that, you try and secure everything you have um, with like internet security. You know? um, and the good news is that we know how to do that. We expose services on the internet, and we know how to do this thing. So zero trust can be implemented uh, really however you like. Uh, it's, you just have to adhere to the model. Uh, so what that means is that they end up looking a lot different from each other sometimes. You know, People have um, networks which are zero trust compliant or are zero trust networks, but they can look so different from each other sometimes that it's hard to connect the dots between, between those two implementations. Right? Um, but I, I think at the most basic level, you know, there are some base requirements. And if you fulfill all the requirements, I would call it a zero trust network. And there are additionally advanced options, right? Like so, as you as these networks mature, um, other components start coming into the mix to kind of like fill in some weaknesses and spaces. And and we we will call those advanced zero trust networks. And they do things like risk assessment and all sorts of fancy stuff, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later. So that's a lot. Um, how do you actually do it, right? Um, it seems like a pretty tall challenge. Uh, these are obviously uh, really, really critical functions. And so what you see is that um, usually several systems will be involved in these things. And uh, typically, when you arrange a network in this way, there will be this natural delineation of control plane and data plane that kind of shakes out uh, from the whole thing. This data plane is a handful of responsibilities. Um, the most obvious of those things is, is tracking uh, user and device inventory. And uh, not just inventory, but really kind of identity. This is really important stuff. Um, in a zero trust network, authenticating the user and the device is critical. It's critical. Um, so you need a source of truth for those identities, obviously. And, and, and so you know, these, these inventory servers is that source of truth. The data that these two inventories house will drive most of the authorization decisions in zero trust network, uh, perhaps the most important pieces of the entire control plane. Uh, some people will put configuration management in their control plane. So for instance, um, perhaps a, a configuration management pulls device inventory and uses device inventory to, calculate, to dynamically calculate host-to-host um, -host security policy and then push that down into the data plane uh, where it can be enforced. Another critical piece of, of control plane is auth sorry about that authorization and uh, authentication. So these can be really, really you know simple, run of the mill, basic stuff, right? Um, can be SSO, or you might even have an IKE server or something like that up in there um, that the devices will perform authentication authorization against in order to determine how uh, to enforce particular flows. Uh, but but this is a really, really kind of contrived and basic example of what a zero trust control plane uh, might look like. So we can get a lot more advanced and detailed uh, than this, of course. Um, and we're missing some stuff, like how does this thing actually manifest itself in the data plane, and yada, yada, yada. So to get a better idea of, of what this actually is, I thought that it would make sense to run through um, some examples of real-world zero-trust deployments. Uh, so with that, the answer is clearly yes, there, these things do exist. They are real. Um, people have done them. and uh, they are kind of hard to find, actually. Uh, there's not a bunch of them. But um, <clears throat> because, especially because they can take many forms, sometimes it, it's really hard to kind of 
determine like, oh, like this is the same thing that that guy's talking about, right? Like, this is the same stuff. So, so I'll show you a couple examples which are very different from each other, but we're kind of underscore, you know, the similarities between the different implementations. Um, some, one of the biggest differences, uh, there's a few things really that, that drive differences in, in these implementations. Um, one is like business requirements, you know? Um, some people are trying to solve a particular problem. Some people are trying to solve a different problem. Zero Trust can solve lots of problems for people, um, but the particular issue that, that you're trying to solve for and, and what your business requires um, can drive, you know, kind of the implementation and, and how it how it's realized. Um, but perhaps the biggest difference, um, <clears throat> biggest differentiating, differentiating factor between these deployments is if you're building for client-side connectivity, server-side connectivity, or both of those things. So I think that it makes sense to, to, to break them down and, and talk about each one individually because they're, they're very, they look very different from each other. Uh, so for now, we'll just focus on talk about the server side uh, for a minute. So I work at PagerDuty, like I said, and um, PagerDuty we implemented zero trust network um, on server side. So we'll talk a little bit about kind of use case and, and how we did that. Um, so for those who don't know PagerDuty, um, we're an incident response application, and we help to coordinate response for large site outages. So we'll page people, wake them up, provide escalation workflows, um, put conference bridges up, show them graphs, things like that. Get, basically get, get outage response bootstrapped and, and going very smoothly. And because this is what we do, people depend on it a lot, right? It, it's something that is a critical function. Uh, so it has to be available. And uh, as a result, we're hosted in multiple cloud providers. And when we receive critical events from our customers, uh, we write them synchronously to all our cloud providers, all our data centers. And we give very strong durability uh, guarantees on that. And uh, this product promise that was made very early on in PagerDuty history uh, led to a particular software architecture. Right? And um, since then, this particular software architecture has kind of been replicated across lots of internal PagerDuty services. Uh, and the architecture involves Cassandra and Zookeeper, um, core and base clusters acro operating across the WAN. So what this means for us is that uh, we have a lot of traffic on the WAN, right? So we have regular WAN traffic, which is like MySQL, slave replication, and things like that. Um, but we also, in addition, have this really, really high throughput and um, uh, quorum-based quorum uh, storage traffic and coordination and things like that. So there's a lot of, of really sensitive crosstalk in the PagerDuty infrastructure that needs to be secured um, between these data centers. And uh, when securing it, authenticity, strong authenticity is also super desirable. Um, because if we can keep strong authenticity, we can preserve abilities to turn up new data centers like in a flash, right? Um, doesn't matter like what subnet they're coming from or anything like that. Like we just inject trust and identity into those entities and then they come up and they join our, our infrastructure. Um, so that's really, really nice uh, thing. Uh, it's desirable to also encrypt all this traffic at once rather than like, uh, you know, kind of like hunting and pecking like, oh, this service replicates over here, so I need to give that TLS, and this thing does that thing, and oh, this is like a sensitive boundary and secure that one and this one. And, you know, application uh, security configuration can uh, differ drastically across different services and things like this. So that's a really hard challenge, uh, something that we didn't really want to uh, uh, do. So instead we took a host-oriented approach. And uh, today, PagerDuty calls that topology manager. Um, but previously, it was, this tech was 100% driven by uh, configuration management. So, you know, it doesn't require, I'll talk about some dedicated software, but it doesn't really require that. You know, we started in, in CM and, and, and you can too. Um, so, but now we have this topology manager thing. And, and topology manager as an agent runs on every host in our infra. This agent is responsible for all local network security configuration. Um, so it receives updates from the device inventory, and then it uses those updates to calculate changes in local policy. Right? So all the enforcement happens locally on the host. Right? Um, I mean, after all, like we're 100% cloud, so we don't really have any network control or big firewalls we can place or anything like that. So this is kind of what, what you know, we were left with at the time. Uh, and the traffic is secured with this device-oriented IPsec policies. Um, so only authenticated IPsec traffic is accepted by the host. Uh, so anything that is talking to our host, like you have to authenticate with IKE and you have to be sending authentic and valid IPsec communication uh, in order for the server to accept those packets. 
uh, all other traffic is dropped. Um, <clears throat> so with that, you know, the device authentication and flow security is kind of handled uh, by the IPsec layer, but the user uh, authentication and security, uh, you know, outstands. So, I mean, in a server-side deployment, clearly, like, that user analogy uh, uh, can get a little strange. Uh, so I like to think that, you know, on server-side deployments, applications kind of act as, like, an analog or a stand-in for the users. And there are two things that we do at PagerD to secure this application layer uh, in our zero trust network. Um, one is that Topology Manager is, is, gets configured with workload information. So when a workload's fired up, Topology Manager will get called and will be informed of like the type of workload that, it, that has just been run. And also some associated policies like, oh, I need to, this port to this host or I need to allow this from this thing kind of thing, right? Um, so we use that. Uh, to configure IP tables rules based on that attached policy. And, and they, they can get pretty granular, uh, those rules. Now, the second uh, way that we secure that application level is through the use of Vault. Uh, so it maintains application level service accounts for us. And um, I'll talk more about um, how Vault fits under this picture um, in a second. But I think that, that really kind of what we're driving at here is just this, this agent handles most of, I would say, all of the zero trust functions except for calls to Vault. So the agent has been, we've thrown basically all, all the responsibility into this agent that we run. Uh, so now we know like a little bit what the data plane looks like. We'll take a look at a control plane and see how control plane interacts uh, with these hosts. So I think that, uh, well, I don't think I know. The, uh, the server side is definitely more static than the client side. So the client side is, is super dynamic, right? But the servers are relatively static and hosts stay around for longer. We kind of know what to expect from them. Uh, most changes in the security configuration in this kind of a, uh, in this server side zero trust network are driven by like introduction of new hosts or introduction of new workloads, right? Or or maybe decommissioning. You know? uh, so I thought that uh, as a result of that, I thought that you know the example I would give would be like a host provisioning example. So when you want to provision a host, you start with an authorized user. Uh, you have to remember that the control plane is extremely sensitive. Uh, like, we really want to tightly control all write access to the control plane services. It's critical, because if you can write into them, then gig goes up, yeah? Um, so this user, for instance, might be on an authenticated device, which has been dragged through SSO and given a top P and all that stuff, you know? Um, so this, this authenticated user sends a request to a provisioning service. Provisioning service separately authorizes a request and takes a whole series of actions. And, uh, you know, the first action is obviously just create the cloud instance, right? So the user passes in like, hey, you know, this is the image I want to use. And this is the data center or the provider that, that I want to uh, kick the host in. And uh, so the provisioner will take that information, work out all the API calls, and make it so. And once the instance has been created, the provisioner, you know, pushes that details into device inventory. Uh, so things like the type of device, the provider, the IP address, the role of the host, um, all that kind of stuff gets pushed down into device inventory by the provisioner. And uh, the device inventory then pushes those updates out to the agents too. Uh, so when the provisioner calls into this inventory, uh, we get to dynamically update and reconfigure kind of all the IP tables and uh, IPsec policies on, on the fleet, you know, if, if we need to uh, for this particular host. The next thing that the provisioner does is contacts the user inventory, which, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the user analogy gets a little strange in, in server land. Um, but uh, I like to think of this user inventory in, in, on, at least in the PagerDuty deployment as Vault, um, because uh, what it will do is it will, the provisioner calls into Vault and then registers the new device, and then using the policy attached to the workload, it will assign secret management policies to that device and inform Vault, hey, you're gonna see this device come up, it's gonna have this public key, and these are the secret management policies that you're going to apply to it when it does come up. Um, so when it does come up, it, it contacts Vault, and, and it's already expecting that call, right? So it's all configured, ready to go. Um, but of course, in order to do that, the app has to know how to talk to Vault. And not all apps talk to Vault. So in the case of legacy services, or maybe services we don't run our, ourselves or something like that, what we do is we configure, uh, we leverage configuration management 
to drop those secrets for us. Uh, so the whole thing is still driven by Vault, by this user inventory per se. Uh, configuration management just pulls it out and drops it into a place for that is compatible, like file file uh, API kind of thing, right? Um, <clears throat> configuration management is used for a couple other things too. Um, we use it to configure the topology manager agent itself, and um, we also can use it to push like supplementary policy into topology manager agent if we need to do that. Um, but this is pretty much kind of uh, uh, the gist of the PagerDuty Zero Trust infrastructure. So what did we accomplish uh, with this whole setup? Uh, definitely one thing we accomplished is no trust in the network. Uh, there is not a single perimeter security device on PagerDuty network or fully perimeterless. And this really massively simplifies the multi-data center setup um, because you never have to think about DC to DC connectivity, which is a really, really nice thing to have. Um, and so... It, as a result of that, you know, like we're extremely agile. Uh, we can turn up new data centers trivially. Um, we don't ever have to like turn up new VPN heads or understand model connectivity models or anything like that. You just put resources there and go. Uh, the only thing you really have to do is you have to teach the provisioner about the new data center and how to make the API calls there to turn up the hardware. Right. Um, and additionally, every single packet is strong encryption and authentication, no exceptions. The kernel is configured to drop packets on the floor if they're not past IPsec. Uh, so we, and we gain further authorization on those flows through really, really fine, those really, really fine-grained uh, IP tables rules, which are dynamically populated also by topology manager agent. Uh, they can get so fine-grained uh, uh, on occasion that we'll specify particular source ports for the flow and, and things like that, right? So... We get uh, that, we get plus, we get the uh, user management and user authentication and automation of that whole workflow uh, through Vault. Uh, Vault issues really, really short-lived tokens to the application, so if the application is compromised or something like that, they're not really going to gallivant around uh, with any kind of sensitive credentials. So that's pretty much what a server-side zero-trust implementation looks like. Um, I'd like to take a minute and talk about a, a client-side implementation of zero-trust. Uh, client side is really, really different uh, from server side for several reasons. Uh, the first is that clients are wild. You know, they uh, they move around and they they operate in, in unexpected ways. Uh, and another difficulty comes in their mobility. You can't really predict where the session is going to come from, and therefore you have to listen to all sessions. And this exposes your authentication service to the internet, which means that if it has any attack surface, that that will also be exposed. Um, and, and finally, one of the challenges is that, you know, the clients will, will act almost as like hybrid zero trust, right? Because they will, they will be making sessions uh, to nodes which are not participating in this kind of uh, secure infrastructure scheme. So because of that, um, and because device theft is super easy, uh, user authentication is extremely critical uh, for the client side zero trust deployment. So on client side, what I'd like, I'd like to talk a little bit about Google Beyond Corp. I think it's a really good example of a mature uh, client-side zero-trust implementation, but it's kind of hard to tell exactly how mature it is just due to typical Google secrecy. Um, but I definitely think it's no secret that Google has a huge network. Um, their corporate network is very, very large, and that means that their perimeter uh, on that corporate network is even larger. It's very hairy. They have tens of thousands of users, accessing thousands of resources, and I don't even want to work there. That's just a guess. <laughs> it's, it's really big, uh, and it's hard to manage. So in addition uh, to the scale and size that, that they have, they have a lot of remote employees. And it's not just like full-time remote employees, but it's also people working from home, you know, people traveling, people out on, on business trips, things like that, um, are important to be able to uh, access all these critical uh, uh, corporate infrastructure. When they're on the road, um, you know, you, you ask questions like, how many visitors might a Google campus see in a day, you know, across campuses worldwide? It's probably a lot, right? Uh, so the perimeter model worked really well uh, when people were doing all of their work physically within the bounds of, like, a business center, right? But I think that we can all agree that that's not really true today, right? People work from everywhere. Uh, so when you when you think about it like this, it's like, well, this is obviously not going to work. We have this little, like, trusted area, but then, like, all these people around it which need access, and we're going to, like, 
you know, figure out all these schemes to tunnel them in and do this and do that. And so it, it becomes really, really quickly a untenable thing um, because the gist of it is that the perimeter becomes too permeable. Like when you have to poke all these holes and get all this access, like it, it, it just becomes not effective any longer, right? Uh, so Google realized uh, this thing and, and they saw that the model was not really working for them. So they launched a project called Beyond Corp. And uh, you might have heard of Beyond Corp. It's a relatively well-known uh, project over there. And uh, it was aimed at moving the entire Google corporate network to zero trust model. So remove all the perimeters uh, in, in corporate network, untrust the entire network. And doing so will ease these connectivity pains and, and scaling challenges associated with it. So let's take a look at their implementation. Um, Client-side implementation is natural to start with a client. So uh, here's a client, and um, the client is basically a user coupled with a device. Right? And when a request is first made into uh, Zero Trust infrastructure, uh, the user gets kicked back to an IDP uh, to do SSO. And, and this, is, this is like really run-of-the-mill typical stuff. Um, <clears throat> They'll just do regular username, password, top P, that kind of thing. Um, and then after authenticating, they, they get kicked back to access proxy. Uh, so access proxy then makes mutual TLS connection with the client. So the client presents a device certificate, and this serves to authenticate uh, the device that the client is using, and also serves to uh, form the tunnel which will secure the traffic uh, between the proxy and the corporate client. Uh, the proxy authenticates the device using public key and authenticates the user ID from SSO. Uh, but it also uses this information to authorize the request. So it passes these details, these identifiers, back up to the control plane. And the control plane gets to take that and compare it against policy and then make an authorization decision, which the access proxy then enforces. Right? And once the authorization exceeds, uh, succeeds, uh, the connection is forwarded to a backend service. And the connection to the backend service is protected and private, uh, but it's distinctly not zero trust. There, there is a relationship there that you know, is distinctly not one that is dynamic uh, like we're describing. Uh, so there's a clear delineation between these models. Once you reach, the ac once you reach that access proxy, you're going into non-zero non trust network. Um, so we can take a look, and we can see the data plane here is fairly simple, right? There's, this is like a model that everyone everyone sees. Uh, so how, let's take a look at control plane on how we drive uh, these kinds of enforcements and data plane. So of course there's a user inventory like every zero trust network. Um, it records lots of user metadata including things like their role at the company, their title, a team they're on, stuff like that, maybe where they live. Um, and, and this inventory backs several services for Beyond Corp. One of those is SSO as I mentioned earlier. Um, these are just regular SSO. The, the access proxy actually supports a, a myriad of, of authentication uh, mechanisms, uh, SSO being one of them. Uh, but this works like typical SSO provider, you know? And um, in addition to, to uh, the user inventory is device inventory, uh, which is also required. And uh, this is a lot more challenging in the physical world because mainly because like hardware is a lot more difficult to describe than some abstract software instance in the cloud. Um, and it's particularly challenging in client-side deployments. Uh, there's lots and lots of different types of devices and, and maybe even like parts get interswapped. Like you might move a hard drive from one desktop to another desktop. And so, so keeping that inventory up to date um, can be pretty challenging, especially a, a scale like Google. Uh, but it's still important uh, to keep this thing despite those challenges, as you'll see. Um, but instead of pushing this device inventory down into an agent, uh, what they do is, is they use this device inventory to push into something what they call access control engine. Access control engine does all the authorization pieces uh, for that access proxy, right? Um, and it pulls data from both device and user inventory simultaneously. Compare both these things at the same time. And uh, it's also loaded with policy. Right? They actually, I think they have a DSL that they write. Um, loaded with the policy. So it makes the authorization decision that after it gets kicked back from access proxy and then whatever it says goes. Yeah, so let's see. So this thing, the access control engine is interesting because it supports whole myriad of inputs. Um, basically, access proxy can just send up these identifiers and then the access control engine uses these identifiers to do lookups in various inventories. So you know we show only user and device here, but there are others. Um, 
so the systems arranged in this way, they can do all the proper authorization and strong authentication and push that stuff down to a data plane and give all the guarantees, nice guarantees that you see with a regular zero trust implementation. Um, but you can tell that these are drastically different uh, networks, right? Um, when you solve for client side or server side. But even though they're drastically different, they, they, they accomplish a lot of the same things, right? Um, there's no trust in the network anymore. There's no trust or untrust. Corporate is no different than the internet, and no perimeter is required. The user is free of VPN requirements. They can roam freely, same as we can turn up servers in any data center. Users can go anywhere they want, and they still get the same good strong authentication authorization they're used to. And uh, finally, similar to our server-side deployment, all requests are strongly authenticated and authorized. Uh, the proxy, though, has the advantage of being at layer seven. So Google can and does authorize every single request that passes through that proxy. So every single request will be also a request back up under the control plane to gain authorization for it. And there's really, really good uh, auditing and, and logging surrounding those things. But you can see that they, they basically achieve the same goals, right? It's just different applications and different requirements led to different implementations. Um, so I would say that these examples that I've set forth, they meet kind of the minimum bar, right? Um, but we can do a lot better uh, than that like pieces of flare style, right? So mature ZT network uh, goes beyond these minimum requirements and, and namely starts taking into account risk, right? How can we understand how risky a particular authorization might be? Um, Beyond Corp has indeed taken steps into this domain, which is a very exciting domain. Uh, they introduced what's called a tr what they call trust inference service, um, I call trust engine. Uh, but this service calculates risk based on a whole number of factors. And, uh, you know, it can, it can say, like, what kind of device is making this request, right? Like, um, oh, it, has, this, has this operating system been patched against, you know, the latest and greatest zero-day thing? Um, and then each of these inputs gets added up to generate a trust score, right? And this score is used in addition to traditional policy. So it helps policy writers catch the unknown unknowns, right? Like, so they can say, look, these are the absolutes that I want to enforce, but also, hey, if something looks fishy, kick it out, right? Um, these suspicious requests might have otherwise been authorized uh, without kind of that, that variable trust score, right? So as an additional concession, the access control engine actually pushes that score down back into the access proxy when an authorization is made. Um, and the cool bit is the access proxy will then take that score and inject it uh, into the backend session. So it'll be like L7, like HTTP tag or something like that. Um, and this allows the backend to make its own fine-grained authorization decisions, right? Uh, it gets to decide, hey, how sensitive is this operation? And is this person scored well, right? Like, are they, is this session a session which looks kind of fishy? Maybe I don't want to allow it admin access even though it normally would have it, right? So we can take this thing, like, one step further even, and we can integrate behavioral heuristics. So for device behavior, perhaps you use S-Flow or some similar network sampling technology, right? And for users, maybe that's just like regular user accounting, you know, and measuring things like successful and failed logins over time. And both of these things, the device tracking and the user behavioral tracking, uh, can come together and you, you fl flow those things through behavioral analysis and then you can generate some risk, like kind of like a credit score, right? And um, results from, from that risk can be used in, in, in uh, consideration with the actual authorization, right? So if you haven't been patched, or hey, you know, like this user normally is, is, is logging into this service like a few times a day, but in the last 10 minutes, they've made, you know, 50 logins, right? Or 50 requests. Maybe that's a little more suspicious than normal, and maybe at that time you want to drag that user through an additional factor of authentication or something like that, or just flat out deny, right? Um, the only problem with that is, is you always have to remember that UX is super important on, on these kind of schemes, right? You start denying people because they look funny, and right? you're not going to be happy with that, right? Um, so, and, and it's not just in daily zero trust uh, operation, but in the migration too. You, you have to take a lot of really great care to ensure that the users are not interrupted or, or inconvenienced uh, in the implementation of this tech, right? Um, so exceptions will be normal. There will be false positives. You should plan for them. Uh, but the good news is that I think that Zero trust generally improves the whole UX story. Uh, most of the authorization and authentication is all automated. So you only surface like the regular user authentication interfaces, SSO, things like that. Uh, they don't have to fool a VPN. They don't have to fool with anything like that. 
Uh, so at the end of the day, I, I think that using this tech is actually easier on the users than it would be if they weren't. Uh, additionally, also, you know, security benefits, all that good stuff. So the reality is all this stuff's pretty new, right? None, like, not even all of it is, is fully realized. Like, we haven't, for instance, we haven't ever seen, or we don't know of, to exist to this day, a, an implementation of zero trust that covers both client-side and server-side concerns. So we don't really even know what that would look like in practice. And um, the, my co-author and I ha have only built the server side of, of this thing. So you know, we've done lots and lots of phone calls and uh, talked to people from practitioners to researchers to CTOs. Um, because the reality is we, we, we don't really know all these answers, right? Um, we're still trying to kind of figure all of this stuff out. Um, so definitely, if, if this interests you, please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to anyone who, who thinks this is interesting because definitely still trying to flesh everything out. And even though it's still not super concrete yet, you're fairly optimistic that despite the state of the union, uh, this architecture, this approach will become the future of infrastructure security. Thank you guys for your time today.